Hi guys, and welcome to the GMBN podcast. Now, you can, of course, watch this on YouTube, or you can listen to it on Audioboom, iTunes, Spotify, or Deezer. Now, this week, it's absolutely fantastic. We have our very own Martin Ashton and Neil Donoghue on, and they talk really candidly about risk, reward, and the hard truths that go with it. There's an amazing chat. It was an absolute pleasure, and I'm super grateful for them having them both on. I really hope you enjoy it, and as always, you know, let us know what you think of it. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy this one. Risk. Now, I'm going to start with a really general question. Neil, what does risk mean to you? Uh, it's only something I ever think about if I really want something, because otherwise the... If something's too risky, then I just won't do it. But if I really want it, then I'll think about risk and then I'll start analysing it. But for me, it's not something I think about that much. Yep. And for you, Martin, if I said, what does risk mean to you? Um, it's a it's a good bearing on the consequence of what you're thinking about. Yep. Um, so it definitely comes into the equation of when you, like Neil said, when you really want something, um, then you've got to start adding it up a little bit. Like, is it is it worth it? What's the cost? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, maybe I see it as a little bit of a, um, yeah, a, a form of measurement, <laughs> I guess, for something you're going to try or not. But that's obviously super interesting when we talk about measurement, because are you, is it the fear of failure? I think some people are scared of failing more than necessarily the specific outcome. Do you see what I mean? They're, they're worried about certain elements. Is, when, when you're weighing something up, do you, are you thinking... Well, how, how is that thought process? How do you quantify those two elements? Um, it's funny. When I think about it, it always goes back to racing downhill for me because that was the riskiest thing I ever did. But it was never a fear of, fear of failure. I think to have that, it feels like you need to be a very successful athlete, <laughs> like someone at the top of their game, like uh, someone like Kelly Slater, who really doesn't want to lose. But to me, I wasn't that. I was someone the positives of trying to do well was much greater draw than the fear of failure. So the, that fear of not winning was never part of my mindset because I wasn't winning enough mm. for it to be there. And Martin, do you feel that fear or that kind of vulnerability of a rider on a bike, does that make our sport what it is? Because I sometimes think with Formula One, they're actually, obviously people sadly still do have really bad injuries, mm. but it's actually remarkably safe now compared to at least what it was, or compared to mountain biking. Yeah. Do you think that sports need that bit of spice? Um, Yeah, well, I mean, mountain bike, you know, fear and danger is built into mountain biking. And I think maybe it's not as recognised as it is it is it as the reality. It's very dangerous. Like any of us who go out on mountain bikes, it's very dangerous. Doesn't matter how good you are. It's, it's a it's a it's a serious thing to do, and it can go horribly wrong on the norm, most normal of days. And that's just true. Yeah. But we don't think about that too much. Um, we we think about when you like Neil would be thinking about risk when he goes at very high speeds on a very difficult track, and I might think about risk and fear when I'm trying to do something on a bike that's maybe out of the ordinary you know, to the everyday rider because I've got that trials background. But the f- fact is it, it sort of should be in the back of your mind all the time. It should mm. be, you should be able to like weigh up what riding is and think, you know, seriously about it at all times. I don't think you're ever going to perform if you think about it too much though. It's funny, I can think of, you know, racing down for 10 years uh, at World Cup. So you do become a bit like a sort of a paramedic you see so many horrible things that eventually it sort of starts you get a thick skin to it because you see lots of people hurt themselves but i remember one uh specifically like mark beaumont did this jump at um that place where fabian Brown won his second world champs lavinia and it didn't it was a big jump but to me it was like that's fine it's not going to go wrong there and he didn't even crash he just cased it a little bit and he broke his his sort of ankle his leg really badly um and it's like hang on why could you you would have never guessed that was going to happen yeah. he didn't even fall off his bike and now he's got a really serious injury from that but you know if you did look at every single one of those risky things you did you couldn't do the job yeah. you couldn't ride your bike because there'd be a thousand of those for each track and most of them aren't the ones you're thinking about anyway and when you were when you were racing you I imagine the motivation was very input output 
you know, I need to do this because I'm going to get a result at the end of the weekend. Yeah. When you stopped racing, how did you then manage motivation, the motivation to challenge and think about risk? Uh, I didn't manage it. It just disappeared for quite a while. Uh, I think Was that a relief? Was that a- No, I think I actually I find it difficult. Most retiring uh, athletes probably go through a very hard time. Yeah if they choose to or not retire, but there's definitely a uh, sort of going cold turkey on it is not an easy thing to do. And for a while, I didn't want anything to do with mountain biking, risks of any sort, anything. I just went off and did something else for a while yeah. and it came back. And now I'm, you know, I have a much healthier view of it all. And I risks now, I don't need to take many risks. So most of the time I'm happy not to bother. Do you think you're a bit of a junkie for that? But I, looking back, I think I was. Yeah, definitely. Um, not now. No, I've sort of had that fix and it's gone. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, really motivational speaks on how to cure addiction. Uh, I really, yeah. whew, I did a lot. I think there's, <laughs> there are some similarities between people. But I, it's hard for me to look at people like G, who's been racing as long as I have and, and carried on. I, I wonder what motivates him now, whether he can keep that same sort of balance well, on He's got bikes to sell now. Yeah. <laughs> Someone like Greg has been doing it for <laughs> yes, longer, great, great but example. there's people there who really sort of I don't know how they do it year in year out. It's hugely draining, though, isn't it? Yeah. When you're like when you're when you're when you really want something, like if you really want to win races or get great results, or if you really want to pull a certain line or something like that, and you get it in your head, it's exhausting because mm. you can't not have it in your head. It's yeah. there. It's too late, yeah. and you know you want it, and the thing that's making you want it is a a mysterious thing that you can't yes. name. And it and it's there and it God, oh, man, it takes your energy so hard. It's just it's so hard to manage. But after you can't get away from it. Yeah, because after yeah, be it Neil Donahue or mine, Ashton or Greg Minar, once they their riding or their racing or trials career comes to an end, they're still the person. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Even though they've left a distinct part of their persona behind. And I always think that was like, you know, you know. I think football is a great example. Imagine scoring in front of 40,000 people week in, week out for 15 years. It's a lot and of one day, ex-footballers <laughs> knocking around. Yeah, mm. it must be such like a... You must feel like you've left, yeah. uh, you know, a great deal of you. Um, because do you feel, you know, I think it's be a really good question in regards to trials, that, not red mist descending, but that state of sort of measured recklessness? Do you know what I mean? Is yeah. it that? Or? Well, I don't know. Trials is weird because when you want to, usually with a trials line, if you're going to try something, especially for like a video part or something like mm-hmm. that, and you've seen a line, um, red mist is not what you want. Yeah. You, you need to not have red mist. <laughs> yeah. So you almost need to like, yes, a really calm and sort of cold situation that you usually find yourself in, whether you're up high on something or you're about to try and pedal your way at something and, and you know how it could go wrong but there's someone lined up now with a camera they're ready they've spent ages getting the shot like lined up and they know where you're going to be in the frame and they're suddenly excited because they think the shot they've got is great and you like can feel the adrenaline coming and then all you can think is calm down (laughs) like because the only way this is going to go right is if you calm down yes and and so it's like a real weird balance of trying to get yourself into a quiet quiet state of like i'm going to do this and Mm -hmm. it's going to go well and there's no there's no going wrong here because if sometimes if you're up on a you know 100 foot ledge you know like well it's only got to go wrong a little bit (laughs) it's only got to be you've only got to slip a pedal yeah and you and you're not you you know you're not going to have a good result (laughs) and it's same with uh the best downhill races in the world are the people that can do that uh who don't think oh i mean i'm definitely a victim of that thinking oh you know i've qualified all right but if i just take this one risk and do that gap i'll do really well yes and that doesn't work most of the time (laughs) there's people who uh, can ride calmly and you see it often often with people who are like come out of nowhere and they qualify really well you know watch this this guy's gonna explode and more often than not they do because they don't deal with the the pressure of being able to perform when they have to and they think more risks generally equals a better result because this is something i've often thought about being on like the sidelines of a race you know what you said there about the cameraman bringing energy when you're trying to get into that quite precarious state of mind you know that focus is somebody being really excited or good or bad i'd always try and be quite calm i would never wish 
good luck. I always just say, have fun. I try and be like, kind of like, almost sort of quite like, almost like parental, like mm. just whatever you do, you're still going to, I'm still going to be bloody proud of you. <laughs> do you know what I mean? <laughs> when you've got you a cameraman there, there like, yeah. oh, go on, do it. Does that disturb that careful, that careful state? Oh, I don't know. I mean, but I, I think, oh, I think you're right. I think you do need people in your corner that are, um, promoting it to be you know, calm and confident rather than being wild um, but obviously with the downhill racing particularly since you're out the gate it's going to be wild whatever happens so but it's nice to start off on a calm footing so you're clearly thinking about what you need to do yeah I think it's different for everyone because I I, I always used to and I think I still do I, I love expectation so if I've got someone with me who's got an expectation like her, I would film with Robin Kitchen all the time for my videos before I had my accident. Um, and he's someone that once the once you've said you're going to do something, he starts thinking how great the shot's going to be. Yeah. And he's no longer, he don't, no longer cares whether you <laughs> chop your own head off in the process. Yeah. It's like you said you could do it. So you've done your bit. Now yeah. it's up to him to get his bit. I see. And, and he, he, you're committed. Um, and I learned to not say I could do something unless I really thought I could with Robin because yeah. he would he would go, well, go on then. <laughs> yeah. He would know, you know, because he wanted that shot. Like donkey day. <laughs> and you want that, yeah, you want that. And and if there was a huge crowd, even more, you know, if there's a huge crowd, I would live off the energy. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah, the more the better. Yeah, I, I love um, that. I learned backflips for a mountain bike magazine. So the idea was trying to learn backflips in a day. I remember I'd done it into swim pool uh, a load of times and we went to do it and Steve Bear, photographer, was like, don't do anything until I get my camera out. And I'm like, I'm doing it. If your camera's out or not, I've got to get up there and do this quick. Yeah. So it's like muscle memory. I've got to do it. And I remember him being really, really pissed off with me because I'm like, no, you can't do it until I'm ready. I'm like, no, I don't care what you're, if you're ready or not. I'm doing it. Watch this. I, I've got a really similar story about Steve Bear, actually. Um, really famous photographer from Mountain Bike UK magazine, which was a huge magazine in the UK. Um, and a lot of the sort of top downhill racers and cross-country stars were in it week, uh, sort of month in, month out. And uh, we used to go on these uh, sunshine shoots with Steve Bear, who would then try and get sort of like 10 features done while you're away. My job on those features is always to try and find something really big, something really, you know, front coverish and and brave and bold because I was the trials dude at the time. Um, and I found this gap on the seafront that was insanely dangerous, but I thought I could make it across. And I, I just had it. It was one of those things. I got it in my head and that was it. I was like, I've got to do this gap. And Steve Bear was like, I'm not that's too dangerous wow. we're not doing it and we had this big row of like am i gonna do it i was like steve it'll be brilliant and in the end i just had to say well i tell you what steve tomorrow i'm getting up at eight o'clock and i'm doing that gap now you can either take a picture of it or not <laughs> wow. and 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 he was you know he'd been he's a really fatherly figure steve and he cares mm. about his riders and and but next morning he was a photographer and he was there ready to take it <laughs> like, well if you're gonna do it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because does that um, you know, I look at or speak to people like you, and it's clear that we, you two, I would say, have a very different relationship with risk to me. I'm nothing like Neil. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not even seeing it. For the audio listeners, the dead pan with Rich Martin delivered that line. <laughs> I think, um, you know, I'm quite, in my personal life, I would say I'm a risk taker, sort of, you know, like in, in most aspects, I'm pretty kind of like fast and easygoing. But in a mountain bike, I'm not somebody that is that. I am quite risk averse. I'm not like an adrenaline seeker. Is risk something that extends into other parts of your life, or that you know? Are you kind of more? Are you like you? Are you risky drivers? Are you very calm and careful? No, I think it's completely personal. I know people that are risky at everything, and then there's people like you that are maybe you know at one and not the other. So I think that completely changes between people. I would say, from my perspective, you might. Yeah, I'm not. I wouldn't say I'm a risk taker. Yeah. I don't really, that, I, I guess it's, I understand why you would say it, mm. but I don't think I'm a, I take, do, I don't take risks. Do you think really. that because you've got a very, you know, like you most likely do a very clear and objective view about your own life or because you, you're you used to taking risks, you're almost desensitised to what risk is? I think you get better at it. Uh, it's funny, like you go in a car with someone who you, who isn't a very good rider, 
And I think uh, they're, they're taking too many risks. Yeah. Uh, they don't know how risky that is on the bike and in the car. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I think when you take risks on a bike in, in mountain biking and you, at the end of the day, you've got to know what's at stake. I mean, I'm very aware of what's at stake these days. Mm. Um, but maybe before my accident, um, I didn't know, really. Mm. Because a lot of the time it's like, well, I might fall off here and break my wrist. Or I I mean, I'm, I'm sure if you added up the broken wrists, ankles, shoulders and finger bones and things between me and Neil, it would be quite a scary number. But yeah, probably would. Um, I don't think that's risk. I just think that's just <laughs> par for the course. It's yeah. like you're going to break bones. But, like I don't, if someone said, but what if you crash? I'm like, well, I probably will crash, but... Yeah. I've worked out it's going to be this kind of crash and that kind of crash until I had the accident I had, mm. which was a very normal crash, mm. boring crash, actually. Mm. And it ended my riding career mm. like like that. I mm. hope that came out nice. Um, and and then you realise what risk is. Yes. And it's not it's not what you think. But it's not it's not broken bones. Yes. It's but I think you know, to most people that perhaps aren't so immersed in the culture of like something like mountain biking like you know i go home with a small graze on my arm mm. and my friend, what what have you done it's like, no, this is absolutely this i would say that's nothing even you know i'll say to somebody oh um yeah they just it was okay they only broke their wrist yeah and somebody goes what they broke their wrist yeah yeah lucky eh? yeah but like what <laughs> no, that's- yeah. there's definitely a scale of these things obviously you know what Martin's accident at one end and I think the other end like you know you, you grow up as I did falling off a bike you learn that you have to go very fast and it hurts mm. and I would carry that sort of through to the rest of the thing so when I eventually bought myself a motocross bike because my parents would ever buy me one I knew how much it hurt falling off a bike so yeah. I treated that thing with a massive amount of respect because you see the videos as well of people having a massive crash on those so like you're realistic about falling off things that you know hopefully most time you're just going to hurt yourself and break a wrist or something but there are these other sides to it that are huge i think it's quite interesting you say that because i would say when you go the other way and for instance when i tried skiing as an adult after being a mountain biker and although obviously skiing is massively dangerous and i was very naive i felt the perceived risk was like it's just snow mm. oh my god mm. this is amazing and suddenly i became a far bigger at taking risk yeah because for me you know my riding thing i love is pedaling and if i don't pedal i go absolutely back crazy mm. so for me actually staying injury free just so i can pedal is, is you know for my mental health it's like self self-medication um something you mentioned there about driving you know being in the passenger seat of someone else i think perhaps some of risk is a lot about being in control because it's on your terms and I, I love that aspect. I love that master of your own destiny. And, you know, to people that say, whenever you hear something like a tragic passing of somebody that's had an, had an accident, the comments or on Pink Bike or whatever, people say, why were they doing it? This is crazy. But actually, I think there's something incredibly poignant about being a master of your own destiny. Are you guys quite, would you say you're c- controlling people? Not not in a negative way, but just in a in a general way, are you when you're driving? Are you reaching for the imaginary brake? Are you thinking, oh, you know, what, what, what are they going to do here? Yeah, totally. Uh, I I try and drive everywhere I can. I hate being a passenger. It's just <laughs> I don't. You know, there's definitely people I trust. Blake is one of those people, and I will let him drive. But I'd rather I was driving. Mm. And it's funny we did a stupid thing for video yesterday where I sat on Blake's uh, handlebars and he, he rode down a field really fast, and I'm like. The worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to fall off on a bit of grass, but I really don't like this because I, I trust that. Blake, yeah. but I still am 100% not comfortable with this. I'd yeah. rather I fell off the bike than him fall off. And I I was the exact, because I was on Doddy's handlebars. You'll see the video, it'll make a <laughs> yeah. lot of sense. But I found that really difficult to relinquish that. Yeah, it's hard when you give control out to someone else. We found it with the random tandem stuff. Anybody who goes on the back yeah. of that bike is not having a great time, it turns out. You know, we <laughs> thought it was, we, we thought it was a great fun idea. But it's really frightening on the back when you haven't got control. Mm. Everyone's the same. They're like they're just freaked out and I think we all want when you when you like into riding bikes or driving cars or you want to be in control of it. And can you imagine you can feel the rider inputs behind you? Do some people tug on those handlebars more than oh, others? Oh, yeah. Well, Danny 
Danny Mac really hurt his shoulders really? when he when he rode the back because he was trying to steer it all day. Yeah. And of course the bars don't move. <laughs> and he, he but yeah. he couldn't stop pulling into the corners. And he, he, yeah, at the end of the day, he'd like really tweaked his shoulders, <laughs> messed up his week, I think. I wonder if it's because riding a bike is such an individual thing. You know, if you were a football player, could you, are you happy to relinquish some of that sort of, um, you know, that trust to someone else? Mm. Whereas, you know, if you're a co-driver in a rally car, that's the scariest thing ever. And they've yeah. got to completely trust that driver. I can't imagine doing anything like that. I can't imagine. Yeah. No, sitting in the passenger seat of a rally car is a scary See, thought. My mum met my dad because she was his co-driver <laughs> rallying. Nice. No way. And um, yes, yeah, so they had a pretty, I imagine they got the, the dynamic dialed pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. But yeah, how, like, I talked to them, some, they've got some gnarly stories like back in yeah. the day of, yeah. and especially because I think they were privateer rallies. So it meant that there was a huge financial implication of crashing. Yeah, yeah. That a professional perhaps doesn't have. Does he kind of co-drive while she's like in the? You know, she's like making dinner. Not who someone. drove your dad or your mum. My um, my father drove. So if your dad's cooking, is your mum like it's broccoli three hundred yards <laughs> yeah. to the left? <laughs> yeah, coming in with a you know salad I think knife. Still to this day, they still have some of that dynamic. For instance, we have like this row of conifers. Like they haven't really got a garden. They've got like a paddock. It's like this row of pine trees. And my mum said, Adam. Cut those trees in half, meaning vertically half. My dad heard, yeah. take half of them out. So right. he got the JCB in a, a big chain and ripped them out. Mum was like, what? You could never listen to instructions then. The communication's important. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That <sighs> certainly is. We uh, should have worked that out on the tandem. The communication was, you know. Yeah, just put earplugs in if you're on the back. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because do you think a lot of riders um, are potentially too risk averse? Do you think not so? Or do you think actually it's their prerogative entirely and just to crack on with it? I, I've definitely got friends who are the per, the people that fall off a lot. They get hurt a lot. But they're also the ones that learn it the fastest. Yeah. But some people don't know when to stop, I think. Um, but you need some of that. Otherwise, you'll never get any good at anything risky. If you can't, if you're too scared of risks, you'll never get good at it. Yeah. Neil, you spoke sort of looking with the retrospect about, about being a risk taker. But as your kind of post-racing career has unfolded, there have been some spills. Uh, <laughs> I believe I have, you know, so many have stories. That. I mean, I, I mean, I've got a reputation, but I don't crash hard. Uh, you know, I used to crash loads if you actually look at the, the old the <laughs> first videos, but I would bounce better because I was probably a bit fitter and in shape. I've always enjoyed taking risks. Um, I've always been a bit of a show-off, like watch this, thinking these people are really impressed if I can jump that gap. Yeah. Watch this, I can do that. And eventually that will spill over into a, cra into a crash and it will hurt. Um, I don't think I've changed really, mm. except I've made bigger mistakes because my judgment isn't as sharp as it was, now, probably. How do you feel being, I think sometimes you see it in, you know, with it, people's kind of relationship with you and how they perceive you. How do you feel when people say, Oh, Neil crashed again. <laughs> I don't like it. Do you, <laughs> but, uh, this Do you think it's because it's, it feels a bit condescending perhaps? Like, well, yeah. actually, I'm really good at this. Leave um, me alone. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I had one really savage comment on Instagram I've talked about in the past about a guy saying, why are you doing this? You've got a child and a wife. Why are you taking these stupid risks? I was like, hang on, I take stupid risks all the time and I can choose what I want to do. I don't want to end up in hospital, but I actually feel like I didn't die. It, you know... It's fine. <laughs> when you were in Chile and things went really, really bad, yeah, were you still? What was you? If you don't, I'm sorry, it's a very personal thing. That's fine. If you could talk about. It didn't. To me, it didn't your, feel like it was really bad. Yeah. Uh, it was just a pain in the ass leg. <laughs> <laughs> I had to sit in a hospital to get fixed. But other than that, it wasn't a problem. Mm. It's not a problem. Mm. I'm going to be fine. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's different. Martin's had to deal with you know much more serious things than that. So for me, I can. I've got, a, a, you know, I've worked with Martin for long enough now to really sort my perspective on everything, and that is not a problem. Me lying in hospital for seven days to get on a plane home is not a problem. Yeah. I, th I think I think that's exactly how I feel about injury as well, and and those consequences is that you. Ne I've not had that experience yet where I've had a a crash or something and gone, oh, that's enough. It's just like, just doesn't, it doesn't register in the same place as going out and doing it. Mm. 
because the moment it does, you just wouldn't go out and do it. If, it, if that bothered I you, did, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't do it. Saying that, in my last year of workout racing, I did half a year, half-heartedly. Mm. And for you know, team troubles, all sorts of troubles, and I fell off Fort William, like Fort William, and really, all I did was cut my arm, but they were scrubbing it out, and I was like, mm. this isn't worth it anymore. Mm. To get a 30th place, this, this is crap. But that was because my head was out of it. I was yeah. gone. Yeah. That was just the, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back. I was already done, anyway. Mm. And what was it like for you, Martin? You know, there's so many, that video of, you know, riding the Fort Bill track with mm. Blake, actually, and mm. yeah. Danny. Coming, reigniting that relationship with risk on a bike. Mm. How was that for you? I imagine that was quite a um, poignant, was it? Or? Oh, I don't know. So there's an awful lot there, dude. Yeah. I don't know. Um, from the perspective of, like, riding again, it was just like, it's just was just as hugely exciting as going out as bikes as ever was. You know, it's just something I wanted to do. And it wasn't, I didn't really connect it to, well, would it be a good idea to continue doing it? It didn't really, it didn't feel like that 10 minutes after I was paralysed. Mm. I still, I wasn't at that point going, God, why, what was I thinking? But mm. I later learned, uh, you know, years later, I learned, an awful lot about what is it risk mentally um, rather than physically. And like I said, like I said at the start, there's a lot of risk, you know, because once you realize the, you know, what something like my injury means to you and the people around you, maybe even more importantly, yeah. it's, it's not something to take lightly, yeah. but it, or there's also a certain amount of power of knowing that it was, um, that I did it, you know, so you have to, like, the responsibility is on your shoulders of what you've done to yourself and what you've done to the people around you, your friends and your family, because they have to now deal with a very different situation too. Mm. So there's an awful lot there, but in terms of the riding, it is right, like, it's just hugely exciting, something I love, that didn't change, never will, and I don't connect really riding with all that might hurt yeah. or whatever. You just don't, I just don't connect the two things because one of them's like massively fun and the other one's something that happens in another yeah. place. Yeah, that's such such like remarkably like powerful way to put it. And um, yeah, thank you for speaking so candidly because I imagine, you know, you've both got, because how, how old is your, your kiddo? Uh, three and a half almost. And, mm. and yourself, Martin? Alfie's 19 now. 19. But he was 13 when I had my accident. He was there, actually, was just right next to me. Yeah. And uh, he was, you know, just all... It was all, it's just one of those things. It was... Yeah. He's always been part of the bike riding. But like I say, I mean, how it, it affected my life, but it also hugely impacted yeah. Alfie's life and Lisa's life. And, you know, it's not something you can really comprehend at the time. Yeah. You just sort of like learn to understand it later on. But mm. I've really had to learn to understand it rather yeah. than, and it's been incredibly challenging. Yeah, no, I imagine. <laughs> it is incredible. It continues to be incredibly challenging. But um, uh, it's just one of those things that you've got to take day by day. But at the mm. time, it just doesn't really, kids really mess, re kids really mess with your head when you come to doing like, um, dangerous stuff on bikes but yeah. i used to use it i used to use it if i was scared of doing something and i was about to bottle it i just if alfie wasn't there i would just go right alfie's what i would put alfie in my mind he's watching me so you're gonna let him see you not do it mm. and then i was like well now i can't not do it wow it's and funny, i just put yeah. him there and i use it I, I so if i could just before I come back to you there neil does that not sound it's funny you know you talk about the the feelings and the and the consequence of something like injury and you also talk about the motivation to do it but it's just amazing to hear the same sounds stupid but there seems to be something and i couldn't put my finger on it but the way you describe it fundamentally unchanged it sounds very powerful mm. just like like strength of strength and that's actually like I don't know. I, I, I don't. I don't. Yeah. It's something like that. I don't know how to put it, but just what you said there about using the energy of your son watching. Yeah. That. 
Well, I think you have to have a motive. When, when you want to do something, look, it's that thing. When you want to go fast mm. or you want to try a certain stunt, that's it. You want to do it. Mm. So you almost know the cost of... You've got a fear of knowing because there are times where you didn't go as fast as you wanted or there's times you, you did bottle it and you mm. didn't do that photo or that bit of that clip um, or that bit in a show. Mm. Um, and you know what it costs mentally when you don't do it. Mm. And that really hurts. Yeah. And and what you end up doing is like, well, the the best result is that I don't go through that. I don't go through that. I failed mm. in your mind. And that's a horrible thing to have. So you once you want it, you're like, well, I really want it. And I also know how much, how bad I'll feel if I don't get it. Yes. I'll feel awful. And I won't be able to forget it. Because I can think of all the things I didn't do. But do you feel that's because as humans, we sometimes imagine the love we receive through our own perspective? Like, I remember, you know, I think of what's important to me. Mm. And then I think that must be the way that my wife must love me. So then I've got to be that thing. Mm. But actually, she'd probably, be, she doesn't care about bikes, really. Mm. She would love me irrespective of that. I, m I remember when I did just this ride that went pretty bad and um, had quite a bad infection. And my my now wife was in the support crew. That's when we were kind of first mm. falling in love. And, um, and the, the power of her observing me do this ride. Mm. and it got pretty bad and I thought I was I kind of thought I was going to die to be honest with you mm. and um, I remember thinking just so desperately wanting to get hit by a car mm. because I just wanted it to be over but I couldn't be the thing that I worried that somebody would think that I, wouldn't, I didn't want to let her see me as the failure mm. you know and, I, yeah. and that was really hard now how, how do you feel about something like that would, would that you, sorry you, I kind of interjected went off a bit of a tangent there but do you think you could do, if you went back to downhill racing now and, you know, your kid was on the sidelines who I'm sure is probably at that age where he views you as an absolute superhero, do you think that would give you energy? I think it would, yeah, probably motivate me. I don't think it's changed anything. I, well, I'd like to think it doesn't change anything about risk. I still do what one do. However, I did think about buying another motorbike actually recently. Mm. And that was one thing when I thought, I'm more, more likely to die on that than anything. So <laughs> is it worth well, it? Is yeah. it worth it to leave Lucas without a dad? Oh, I see. I mean, and yeah. it's probably not, yeah. but I don't feel like that's, you know, the same risk on riding a bike. I, you know, I could be wrong because people do die riding bikes. But for me, motorbikes was too big a, a leap. It's like, it's not worth what I'll get from it for the risk of it. But with mountain biking, well, then for me, it's different. There's a guy called Shane McConkey. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, a real famous free ride skier. And he died, base, I think, base jumping in the end. Or ski, that, base that ski base jumping, yeah. Incredibly gnarly. And it almost seemed like he'd had any concept of risk and reward shattered by being at the very forefront of his sport. If it wasn't for mountain biking, I, to be honest, if it wasn't for mountain biking, I would be desperately sad. If it didn't even exist, well, it wasn't even sad because it didn't exist. But I think I'd probably just be like a long-distance runner or a cross-country skier because it's actually that getting to the place of mental and emotional depletion that is really... I feel is really good for me. Do you think that you would have done extreme things? Do you think it would have been a, a motor? I suppose you started moto trials. Do you think it would have been bikes, bikes, bikes in a different a motorized avenue? Yeah, personally, I would have found something to do. Yeah, get my thrills mm. definitely. And if it wasn't my advice, it would have been something else: yeah. skateboarding, whatever. Yeah, it's hard. It's hard to think of anything beyond bikes because they. What, if you get into it like probably myself and Neil have got into it like really young age mm. like I started on started actually competing week in week out on motorbikes when I was 11 right. so it was just something that and people start much younger than that but you know even at that age it's hard to imagine what direction things would have gone in without that but yeah I would have I think it's part of I think it's part of my makeup to be testing myself you know i mean it's funny what you said about the motorbike i i actually i'm sort of i think i'm quite contradictory and quite selfish in my kind of like what i will do and what i would like to see other people do because i would never worry about riding a motorbike in terms of being a dad because it is incredibly dangerous but i wouldn't i've got a motorbike with electronic legs that go up and down and i ride it as a paralyzed man it's totally insane and it makes riding a motorcycle even more dangerous like it needed to be <laughs> out on the road yeah. around other pu other people in cars and um but if my son said he's getting a motorbike i'd be like no you bloody in that's mm. ridiculous it's too dangerous <laughs> so it's completely contradictory mm. and 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 i'm not thinking about you know 
oh, you know, I could go out and Alf, I could have a crash and Alf wouldn't have a dad anymore and yeah. what if I don't, I'm not thinking like that. But if Alf, mm. if Alfie said he wanted a motorbike and I know he likes motorbikes <laughs> and I can tell you now, son, you ain't having one. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't happening. <laughs> Actually, he's 19, he can do what he wants. I hate losing control of it. Yeah. God, they get to a certain age, you can't control it anymore. Oh, Damn it. Outrageous. Can't control the parentage <laughs> bit. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did my motorbike test probably when I was in my early 30s. I remember my mum being absolutely devastated. Mm. <laughs> Motorbikes are so much fun, though. They They're are, just they? too much fun. <laughs> I mean, you can just... I remember going up recently, um, I, I rode my motorcycle in North Yorkshire, and I was going up this hill that seemed like it was going off into the sort of into space it just pointed up into the sort of horizon and i nailed my bike up there i was doing about 110 mile an hour up this hill and i, I just thought well you... all the only thing that's holding <laughs> me on this bike is um, was a piece of gaffer tape around my legs and i thought if i just let my fingers go i was at the moment if i just let my fingers go i would just be whipped away from the bike because the gaffer tape would never hold me and it was the most exhilarating feeling like the only thing that's keeping me alive right now is have you ever been to my TT? fingertips <laughs> talking about risk have you ever been oh, to watch the yeah, Art Man TT that insane. is next level that leads me really nicely on to my to the kind of thing I want to talk about next you know say something like downhill racing the tracks are getting more high speed which might or may not be more dangerous. I think it's kind of the consequences are, are quite varied. But in the way the kind of mountain biking that we watch and racing at least is going, we all were on 26 and the racing was close. And then it became a bit of an arms race to get the fastest 650 and then subsequently 29er. Was there any point? Because we just got close racing again, everyone's happy. Is it? Should we just be saying, hold on, let's just... All we're going to do is increase the speed, but not going to increase the quality of racing. I'm just playing devil's advocate here. Mm -hmm. Because you look at somewhere like Leo Gang, where the racing's very tight, but not necessarily good. Personally, I'd rather see a Sam Hill-esque figure come and smash the field apart by eight seconds or something tech. But do you think that as a sport and as a governing body, what's the relationship of responsibility towards the athletes? Um... I don't know, UCI is uh, quite tight with the rules on bikes. I know you can obviously run bigger wheels now, but in the past, you know, they've kept quite a close eye on that. But I don't think there's much more you could do with Dana. Well, I'm sure they'll all obviously not naturally develop, but I don't think there's anything really going to make a massive leap forward. So the bikes have changed. I, I'm not sure that, that necessarily that it's got faster because I know in the early days oh, when I raced yeah. that there were some really, really fast tracks. Um... I think the bikes nowadays let people travel over more difficult terrain faster. You can't argue with that. No. But it doesn't seem to be like there's more injuries than there was. I mean, I'm sure we could actually work this out, but yeah. it's always been similar. But with something like the TT, if those guys were all going 15 mile an hour slower, mm -hmm. or is the exhilaration the fact that it is the most extreme with the most extreme riders I think in the is. pinnacle. I think right. And uh, it, it adds like a, you, a melting pot. You want the, the most amazing bike to be ridden in the most amazing way, and that's what the manufacturers and the riders are striving for, and that's what makes it the pinnacle of that thing, which is sort of the same with downhill. Mm -hmm. Like, if you can get that bike to go faster mechanically and the better rider, then that's what we want to see. Mm -hmm. So that's just mm -hmm. natural for sport. I think, I think in... It, in downhill in terms of like what the governing bodies could do you could make the tracks a little bit calmer and i suppose at times they are getting a bit more bike parky than they were but you're never going to stop the fastest people going ridiculously <laughs> yeah, dangerously fast and uh, to be fair the tt at 15 miles an hour isn't safer mm. um it, it's it's still <laughs> they'd still be someone who goes ridiculously close to a wall and yeah. you'll never stop the the crazy people going crazy and doing it just to its absolute limit you know it's i mean you think about the cross-country riders you know would you ever you know would we ever sort of try and tone down a cross-country trail because nino's going down the downhill trail too fast or yeah, too scary really or too yeah. dangerously or and if you, you just can't at, do it you look at the ultimate uh, at the tt you know lots of people lose their lives there it doesn't stop 200 people showing up next year one no. death doesn't stop 200 people going oh, I still want to do that but it's like Formula 1 in the in the 1960s mm. and they were there with just goggles and open face helmets yeah and obviously you know you become 
desensitized to it. But just to have ill class B in the eighties, you know, mm. to turn it off and be like, well, you know, uh. that's a great race, lads. We'll um, see you next week. We only, we only have to say goodbye to two or three close personal friends this weekend. Yeah, it's and a, they it's... still because I think there's a, something about I don't know if it's because our culture or genetics. I'm I'm just not enough of a I don't know anywhere near enough about to talk about why it is that young men love to get themselves into this sort of business you know yeah i mean just about, like recently uh fabio widmer put out this oh, amazing gosh. video okay. where he's just absolutely smashing his but it's urban free urban free ride lives i think it's called mm-hmm. um uh is it three jack yeah and that that's basically him just smashing his way down any stair set he can find between his home his home in leon and Paris and it's insane you know and and he is a fabulous rider and a in, he's obviously very good at crashing you know you get good at crashing so he's confident he's going to get away with stuff but in that video I think even he'd admit there's a couple of places where luck comes into it and and so to know that that's that's what people will do they will they will push it to a point and I'm I guess I'm one of those people Neil probably too is like we're, there's riders that will push it to like where they're willing to go into the space of I might get lucky and get away with it, which is what you can see in that video, and it's scary to watch, but it's just something we'll do, and it's it's weird, but it's weird, yeah. wonderful at the same time. Do you think it's just a little kind of statistic? What I once read was that Lance Armstrong never had a puncture in any of his winning Tour de France's, or winning and mm. inverted uh, commas, <laughs> but did on his comebacks. Do you think it's perhaps an absence of bad luck rather than necessary? That's kind of what you're hoping for. As mm. long as things don't go actually badly, mm. then I'll probably get out of it. Well, a lot of time we just don't, do, you know, you don't necessarily ever think, well, oh, no, that'll yeah, happen no, to no, me. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. that'll never, you know, I, I mean, I, you know, think of your worst crash, Neil. Did you ever think, of, oh, that'll happen to me? Actually, you probably did. You know, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's probably likely uh, I'm gonna take it was this likely road cycling corner at 60 miles an hour <laughs> it's quicker than that <laughs> <laughs> because would you guys something I struggle with is um, I get a lot of small injuries that hamper me because something will happen and I'll think don't be a wuss ride around it ignore it you know especially with endurance cycling do you guys consider yourselves tough as people mentally do you consider yourselves quite tough i suppose i do a little bit Mm. um i don't know i feel like no one necessarily wants to hear your woes so you might as well deal with them yourself as best possible so even if my ankles hurting really badly no one's that bothered so just deal with it and (laughs) I don't want to say man up because that's not necessarily right, but you know what I mean? Just be a bit stoic about it because no one really cares. Stoic is a great word. <laughs> yeah, no, you can right. The word stoic sums you up, I think. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> what was that quote you said yesterday? This wasn't as fun as I thought it would be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's my motto for life. This isn't much fun as I thought it would be. <laughs> How about you, Martin? Would you say you're a tough person? Uh, no. No. No, not really. No. But do you think that's <laughs> my, could, it's my simple you, answer? I've learned I'm not. You could ever be tough <laughs> if you. Sorry, I'm going to get my words in a twizzle here. Mm. Do you think you could ever actually be tough and you know a rugged person with whilst conceiving yourselves to be tough? <laughs> do you see what I mean? Yeah, I know. I think there's a, there's a bit of self effacement to it. Yeah. And you kind of you have to, if you're not saying to yourself, "Oh, I'm not tough." I, that means I've got to crack on. Mm. But I think sometimes people think they're really, really. Um, kind of you sometimes see it in like reality TV and things like that people think oh I can handle anything and then two days in the jungle or whatever what it is they're just like I can't do it I need a Starbucks you know I couldn't handle the jungle if that's what you're asking no way no way well you're vegan what would you eat it's only ants well no that that would be my power in there wouldn't it (laughs) yeah Um, yeah the rice and beans would be no problem I could do it Um, (laughs) sorry I've got off track I'm thinking about being in the jungle now as riders and as riders that are obviously annexed to a, a personality and a person, are there any risks that you may have got away with, but perhaps you think, well, what was I thinking even in the first place? And secondary question, 
do you have any knock-on effects or consequences of in terms of your personality in a way that risk has changed you um the first question about sort of so a risk that i've so something i maybe done and thought looking I, back with the degree of hindsight look, thinking, looking what back over thinking like if you've been a fly on the wall you'd have been like you're an idiot <laughs> What are you doing? Do you know what? It's hard to look back over something I've done mm. and, re and regretted it or thought it was too much of a risk because I have, take, I have done stuff on my bike where it's a definite die moment, mm. uh, maybe too many times, where you're like, well, why, why would I be willing to put myself in a place where I could die for a photo? Like a photo. Mm. You know, what's the point? But I, but I have. So, and I've always seen a photo and gone, <laughs> yeah, that was... <laughs> That was sick. Oh, <laughs> but I do remember lining up to do a uh, bit like the story I said about with Steve Bear. It was on a, one of those shoots, and I lined up to do a gap across from this sort of cliff edge to a rock that went down into the sea. Mm. Um, and I thought I could kind of like do it like a step down, sort of get to the edge, stick a couple of pedals in, and gap it, and then sort of land in the downside and sort of ride it out like a, like a, almost like a landing, mm. and then drop down into the basically into the rocks in the sea. And I just was, I got so obsessed with the photo that I was like, I've, I've, I'm just going to absolutely smash this. And I was super excited about it. I was on the bike ready to go. And my friend, Martin Hawes, stood in front of me and was like, we're not doing this. Wow. And, and, uh, and I was in that place of like, I'm doing it. Mm. And it, and because it was another rider, not a photographer, I, I remember thinking, oh, maybe I shouldn't do it then. Yeah. And then I didn't do it. And we went back the next day and I could clearly see the next day where it was off my radar. Like, what the hell? There was no way I could do it. But it's funny, you know, going back to, to kind of clarify my question a bit, an example yeah. I'd cite is that when I took my better half for the only time we've ever been mountain biking, mm. <laughs> she was kind of talking at the beginning, how hard is it? Oh, God, you're right. And I was like, honestly. And then eventually I was like, you know what? Fine. We'll go at the bike park. Mm. Got her downhill bike, yada, yada, yada. Literally, first corner, she just went, it was on downhill bike. Mm. So, went full steering, hit steering lock, went like oh. the front wheel bit, went over the bars, literally fell down. It's like a two and a half meter drop. Oof. Anyway, and yeah. she got up and she was like, absolutely fine. She didn't care. I was traumatized. Yeah. <laughs> what have you done to me? And I, we then went even like road cycling, and that was like um, jumping in cold water. It's such a shock to the system. Mm. That suddenly I was more aware of the dangers and I think I became a royal pain in the ass because I was like, even road cycling, I'd be like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's think about, we were living in France. Uh. Let's think about these turns. And now, you know, and I probably became an absolute, well, I was undoubtedly a nightmare. Do you, I mean, you must, have, now that you're kind of, your kid's grown up and he's getting out on the bike, perceiving risk that you're getting away with, do you, yeah. do you have anything you look back on and you think, oh, I really shouldn't have done that. That was unfair. Mm, not really. I think he, if I got away with it, that's done dust. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. well, that's what I think. Yeah. Got away yeah. with it. Mm. Uh, may have been a big risk. and I, Maybe I didn't realise how risky it was at the time, but I got away with it. So yeah. I don't spend much time thinking about that anymore. Yeah, no, of course. Yeah. I definitely don't really regret anything. I've definitely made a few bad choices that have led to injuries. Um but if you spent your time thinking about it, regretting it, I don't know how you'd get on with doing anything else. So I, I, I write that one down as a mistake and now I'll forget about it. And do you not feel that, I think sometimes the times I've been scared of injury or coming back from something and worried about getting re-injured and say I have a, 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 like say separate my shoulder and the injury was probably like six weeks. It was like a, mm. quite, a, quite a big one. And instead of just processing that, like a, a normal healthy person say well I'm not going to ride my bike for a bit I'm going to come back better I started riding again after I think four days just like I couldn't it was a, like it was one of those type four I think so it's quite a and I really didn't have much movement and it meant the lingering effects of that risk and that injury I never processed it so then I didn't enjoy riding for like four months <laughs> when actually if I'd just taken the hit on the couple of weeks and then come back healthy do you think there's an element of that and especially racing you know, you've got demands this race is a big one and it's coming up in two months. You better be fit. Yeah, I mean, I, I used to spend a lot of time racing. I semi-injured, even if it was something not very serious, but a swollen knee or something that hurt a lot. So, yeah, there's blurred lines there definitely of just having to ride. Um, with the bigger injuries, 
I wouldn't mind sitting around for a while because I think it'd be like the enjoyment of getting back on the bike after sitting around is is great. So mm. it's like those peaks and troughs. If, if it's all the same, you know, you can you can stop enjoying it as much. So it's nice to have a bit of time off the bike, and I would use those times to really go away and do something else. So yeah. when I do come back to riding a bike, I'll really enjoy it. I sometimes find that frustration is like motivation for another day. You, you'd be going yeah. a bit stir crazy at home. Oh, I can't ride today because of X, Y, Z. And I sometimes try and hold on to that and enjoy the mandatory, oh, yeah. well, I can, I can use this, you know? It's yeah. like an energy that's... Um, I, I think the, part, of the, part of the art of being a, if you're, you know, a professional athlete of any kind, part of the art of it is knowing how to come back from injury and mm. manage injury well. People who can do that tend to do really well in a sport and mm. people who can't tend to be frustrated buy it you know and yeah. they, they don't succeed it's difficult i was literally watching the pipe masters at the moment uh so john john florence one of the best surfers in the world tore his acl uh, so that's a big recovery oh, that's a big one yeah. and he's not quite ready to be back but he is because it's outside his house basically he's both surfing yeah. and he's doing really well nothing like a short but he's now like oh i'm just here to have fun but he's doing really really mm. well it's mm. probably earlier than he should be but does that not make someone like i'd say rachel atherton even more exceptional because she's come back from so many big yeah. ones and similarly on the other end of the spectrum obviously probably one of the greatest of all time aaron Gwynn. for years through all his initial part of his career you know he was beating a lot of riders by a hefty margin but he'd never had at least on the world cup circuit maybe in his younger life but a really big injury mm -hmm. as a consequence of racing we've noticed in the last 18 months two years he's Strange. had these little niggles yeah and do you, I, I wonder if that's taken you know, just taking that little, that 1% off and compared to someone like G who seems to be, you know, just goes through everything and keeps coming back. And you think, well, in a, in a sport that is sometimes decided by incredibly tight percentile margins, mm. it's no wonder, mm. <laughs> you know, that the person that doesn't have the, had, hasn't had a history of injury mm. seems to be winning. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, if you can mentally handle what it takes to come back, because until you've you had a big injury and had to come back, or, or, or a big loss, you know, like the people who are great who are the people who can come back from an injury or win again, you know, like yeah. it's all, when you're winning, it's the easiest thing in the world. You almost can't help not win because you're just in that vein of form. Yeah. That's why you're winning. But, and when you lose that, which inevitably all of us do, um, trying to get it back again is very frustrating because you can't really put your finger on what did it. Yeah. You know, like there's just, we've seen it in downhill so often that someone just like, like Ormore Piron's in that, mm -hmm. in that period of his career at the moment where it's like, well, he's just, he is just one of the fastest dudes and that's just how it is. Yeah. But he, there is going to be something that the bike's going to change or he's going to unfortunately have an injury or, you know, something's going to stop him winning and then he'll have to try and find it again and, that's where we'll find out is he one of the greatest riders or not yes. it isn't now because now's the easy bit you know someone like danny hart who just who, who is always thinking technically how can he get all the things he needs to be at the top he, he keeps finding his way back into the top three or four and on the verge of winning mm. and and that's really difficult to, difficult to do and then someone like rachel who can come back from injuries time time again losses time time again and still be the person to beat that's how you know Issues. you're talking about someone special because yeah. they can do that you know winning when you're winning she did win, not the marker she won world champs i think it was three weeks after a broken collarbone yeah <laughs> i mean that's yeah. well um another great example of pom pom yeah yeah you know, coming back this year yeah and i think even someone like pauline fran who had that issue i think it was i can't remember it was a quite hard to diagnose issue with her mm. legs or lower body and um i think cross country you've got to know you've got it mm. to go into that place and it's you know when you're in a huge amount of self-inflicted pain mm. you do want to kind of let your foot off the gas mm. and i think it must take a huge amount of strength of mind and strength of will to not only really train for that but in the head of the moment going so what if i didn't have a good early season mm. so what if i didn't have all that that high-end power training that racing essentially is because i'm going to go and no, stick it to them. Yeah, when you've got belief in yourself, it's the most powerful thing. Yeah, because because when it's really there, it's 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 real, mm. and you just you can use it. The time, I mean, I, you know, if I get a video idea in my head, even now, I mean, I'm sat here in a wheelchair, but if I got a video idea and I thought, 
I think I could do that. I th- really think I can. I'm not mm. just saying it. And that makes it almost like, oh, this, this, this stuff's happening. You know, I'm going to do it because it becomes a real thing. Mm. Have you ever had it, Martin? I've done it. Well, I've but gone to a race, <laughs> it'd be a British national enduro and be like, I'm going to win this. I know I'm going to win this. Uh, I feel great. I My form says I'm going to. I've beaten everyone at this race easily in the past. And then you don't. I'm like, oh, that feels like it's a real kick in the teeth. Mm. Have you ever had that where you're I'm just I, sure I, you're on form, you're going to do this thing and it doesn't happen? I've, I've, I've never really had that feeling of like I was going to win. I always used to go into events thinking... I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose unless I unless, mm, and then yeah. whatever you know that I'd be like you know, I'm I'm gonna lose this mm. so I'm I'm, and I would, yeah, just be so scared of losing. It's, but I mean, I wasn't like someone who, you know, I you know, I mean, in trials, it's a very different space mm. to what you guys were doing. It's a very different mentality. Um, I've never really lined up on that race start line and had to deliver it in that sense it's a different thing i think it's i remember speaking to tracy hannah quite a you know we talked quite a lot about this when i was working for polygon and she was saying how she found herself in a really interesting situation in 2017 because she focused on her home world champs in cairns Mm. and found herself in the leader's jersey of the overall and was like well all these years i've been trying to win the overall and i haven't been able to crack it Mm. and the one time she's not even thinking about it, she finds herself in that position. And she took a lot of that thought process into the 2018, subsequently 2019, when she did win the overall. But she also found herself in a situation, which she'd never been in as well, at Cairns, of being like, I'm going to win this race, and not hell or high water is going to stop me. Yeah. Subsequently, it didn't pan out like that. And she had a really hard time, I think, accepting, well, you know, it must be a very hard thing to accept, yeah. both elements. Like, actually, I've been doing, I've been getting the wrong, I got the right result by doing what I thought was the wrong thing, and I got the wrong result trying to do the right thing. I, I try and be realistic about this. I think psychology, is this whole podcast has been about psychology, basically, mm-hmm. is a very important part of riding and racing, but actually, being the best rider is what still wins races most of the time. So the best rider probably won that World Champs on the day. Well, I think um, the UCI timing had a bit of to do with it. Okay. <laughs> but when we talk about Bruni and Whoa. Pirion, Bruni and Pirion, like they are literally the two best riders. One or two, yeah, they've both got a good head game, but actually they are just very, very good at riding bikes fast. And that's why they're winning. Not because they're super tough mentally, because there might be someone who's coming 10th is super tough. They're just not as good at, on, at riding a bike fast. So you've got to remember that psychology is a big part of it, but you've got to have the the actual means to do this thing in the first place. Yes. Yeah, that's absolutely true. You can't you can't do it. You can't do it any other place than on the bike. Mm. Um, you can dream you're winning all day all day long, but yeah, you've got to you've got to actually turn it into reality. But like I said, but once you think you can. <clears throat> excuse me once you think you can turn it into reality you're nearly unstoppable well, first, like if yeah. like you know you, you can then you can do it and that feels blooming good but then like, especially with Daniel it's, it's quite a short season and it's written off and you have to start again like we've seen with Danny Hart win a few races in the year and then boom season's yeah. over try again and everyone comes back ready to roll yeah so I'm gonna begin to wrap it up but there's a f- one or two questions I want to ask you both Martin did you make that bloody gap on the seafront yes i did multiple times i loved it <laughs> absolutely loved it until my chain clicked on one of the goes and i thought oh better stop <laughs> on a similar trip uh i don't know if you were there you may well have been there g was lining up a snake river canyon gap yeah. and we had to talk him out of it mm-hmm. it's hard to do as well yeah. when someone wants to do something yeah. you nearly can't stop them yeah. because they're like well i'll well, just do it when you're not here that's what I was like. I'd be like, well, I'm just going to do it. That's quite a um, good, good advice. But when riders start telling you, you've got to start hearing it a little bit because, yeah. because yeah, you can get a little bit drunk on it. Mm. <laughs> and um, my lap penultimate question is immediately after, you know, going you, an injury, I'm thinking about your injury, Martin, but also especially, Neil, with your life-threatening injury in Chile and you're smirking but that's what it was and you know you can you can wrangle with that yourself was 
Was there, a, was there a moment initially where you were like, oh, bloody hell's teeth, what have I done here? Now he is. <laughs> <laughs> still, talk, still going yeah. on about this. Yeah. It was uh, fine until you said that. <laughs> uh, no, because I'm in the mode, uh, practical mode of dealing with it. Yeah. And I don't think about it until much later. But no. Travel insurance straight away. How much are you going to pay out? Yeah. Uh, no, I just, yeah, I, I tend to feel like it's done, too late, don't worry about that. Yep. You've got to deal with it. So how are we going to deal with this thing? Yeah. And yourself, Martin? Similar? Um, yeah, I mean, I just, I think when you've had a big injury and you're lying in a hospital bed, you're thinking about getting well yeah. rather than how you got there. And I think that's for a, yeah, that's for a later time. Yeah. You come round to that and it will come round. Yes. And you will have to deal with it. <laughs> yeah. Something I think about a lot, and one kind of, I suppose, my kind of my mantra is just acceptance. I always tell my things just to accept things. Um, you know, even in a personal capacity, uh, I'll always be like, just accept things. And one time, my, and I, I don't know. Yeah, I've always, I've always been like that, and I, I will have a lot of respect for effort. I'm very bad at dealing with people that don't really like to suffer. Do you know what I mean? Like if I want to ride and someone's like, oh, it's raining, but it's raining for me too. Simmer down. You know what I mean? Like I can't, I, I'm, I'm oh, really you're one of those that. tough guys. <laughs> oh, I've read, read about you. Yeah. 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 But I don't know, like I'm just, I'm probably quite good at being uncomfortable, but not very good at being in pain if you see what I mean. Yeah. And um, I remember one time, me, my mother and my sister were in the car with my niece. My niece was probably about a year old at this point and she started crying. And we all said quite nicely, but just stop crying in unison. And I was like, this is where it's come from. And needless to say, she stopped crying. Yeah. And I was just like, oh my God, this is like the core of my, this is how it happened. Yeah. And um, my final question, and a nice kind of way to wrap it up, um, would you recommend risk? Ooh, that's a big question. I absolutely would. With. I think you've got to, uh, you'll learn much quicker. You'll have a good idea of what is risky and what isn't risky and what is too much risk. I definitely think it helps with not just riding bikes, literally your outlook on life. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you don't want to get any nasty surprises. I think you need to know what works and what doesn't, personally. Uh, I would say you're already at risk. <laughs> you're already at risk. Mm -hmm. whatever, whatever you're doing, you're already at risk. So you may as well do the things you want to do. And if you've decided you're going to do something, then mean it. Like if you don't half, yeah. don't try and do something and especially on a bike, but just in life, mm -hmm. you know, if you're going to try and do something, really mean it mm -hmm. because that's the, that's the uh, quickest route to getting it right. You know, if you're all in, it will probably come out all right. But if you, the moment you put a bit of doubt in there or you don't quite go hard enough, See, it probably ain't going to work out. <laughs> you you said that it would be quite a hard question to wrap up with, but I think you just did a bit of You knocked out the bar, both of you. And I um, just want to say thank you very much for all your time and all your just frank Cheers, discussion. It's been, it's been awesome. Cool, right. that's 11 please. <laughs> Is that it? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs>